Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you, wherever you are. My name is Bala. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Zaffin. And uh, today, along with IBM, we are discussing how to de-risk your core modernization program. Uh, as you may know, we, we held uh, uh, a webinar jointly with uh, Jerry Silva of IDC uh, a few weeks ago. And this is in continuation to that webinar. And today, along with me, is uh, Chuck from, from IBM. And uh, let me turn it over to Chuck to introduce himself and uh, kick off the webinar. Chuck? Hi, everybody. I'm Chuck Callio. I'm from the IBM Z Systems, otherwise known as the mainframe division. And I manage ISV relationships in the banking industry. And in particular, the relationship that IBM Z has with Zaff. And, and I just want to give a little bit of an overview in my personal thoughts. I don't think in business there's anything more important than product and pricing when it comes to really realizing the intersection of improving customer experience and innovation. I'm pretty convinced that there's tons and tons of work to be done in product discovery, product pricing, and that kind of stuff around innovation. So especially in, in environments where things are very dynamic and like the current global environment we're with. And um, I'm really, really pleased to be on the phone with Bala. Bala is a very seasoned, uh, practical, uh, banking expert. He knows this stuff very, very well. And from the IBM perspective, and especially from the Z system perspective, there's no industry more important to us than banking. So this should be a really fun and exciting webinar. So sit back and relax. And you can really start to see us talk about the how of using Zaffin's products to do a core modernization and some of the specific use cases and super specific client value that we see as a result of that. So back to you, Bala, to start things off. Thank you, Chuck. And, uh, and before we uh, put this into high gear, what I thought I would do is to uh, share a little bit from the prior webinar, you know, the takeaways that we all uh, took from uh, what Jerry spoke about. So uh, to me, to me, I saw three things that Jerry really uh, hammered home on. And, and really they were around the ability for banks to envision uh, a future state architecture. And, and this is critical because if you, um, if you are embarking on a journey, it's, it's very good to have that vision of where you want to get to, what, what are the components that make up this transformation uh, along the journey and have that vision uh, with guiding principles so you know uh, when you get there, uh, how exactly you got there. So that's uh, a key takeaway for me. Along with it, uh, Jerry also touched upon the need for building the right applications on top of this digital infrastructure that you're all creating. And, and doing that would be a really good first step to enable modernization to happen. But uh, for modernization to really happen at scale, and to enable the type of customer experience that you want to do, all workloads that you have should be leveraging uh, AI, not just as an afterthought, but as, as AI being embedded into, into the workload itself, uh, so that that makes the transformation journey really useful. And so with these three things, if you've enabled them, uh, what they lead to is, truly superior customer satisfaction, along with business efficiencies, as well as continuous innovation that happens. So uh, those to me were kind of like the key takeaways from what we did the last time. How about, uh, how about for you, Chuck? Well, Bob, I, I want to tell, tell a story that's really aligned with customer satisfaction, business efficiencies, and continuous innovation. So I go on vacation for the last two weeks, I get back, and yesterday we get the big stack of mail from the post office and I have two things from a bank. And one of them is from a new bank I'm not uh, a customer with yet. And I was very pleased to see a bunch of out of the box offers around different kinds of things relating to 
I, uh, different initiatives for automobile uh, repair, concert tickets and all the kinds of stuff I was hoping to see from a bank. And then number two is in the mail yesterday, I did receive four very small amount dividend checks. And in my current bank's mobile check deposit application, I have been so disappointed in the error prone level of that, I physically drove to the bank to deposit four very small checks because I've about had it with my poor customer experience with the mobile check deposit app of the current bank I'm with. So I had two really good experiences yesterday around banks and customer satisfaction, really in the wheelhouse of Zaff and that being you know products discovery, pricing and those kinds of things. So. I thought it was uh, really uh, an interesting story to share as, as we go into our webinar and our discussion today. And I know, Bali, you would get a kick out of that. That, that uh, I, I, think, I think just about everybody on this call can relate to that, um, largely because that is the order of the day, right? While, while, while all of us are really focused on, on this customer satisfaction, uh, we actually tend to forget what are the customer journeys we are seeking to enable, and and so um, so I think the rest of the webinar we'll spend some time focusing on that journey enabled innovation to happen and to make that the key agenda as you embark on this modernization or transformation. Uh, so with that said, uh, in addition to what Jerry spoke about last time, I thought I'll add a few more. Uh, that we are seeing uh, in from the research analyst space. So in particular, what I show here are uh, perspectives that Gartner as well as Forrester are also speaking about. Gartner in particular speaks about what high performers do. And what they do is they tend to modernize their infrastructures that they've built up over the past many, many decades. And, and modernizing it now, uh, makes it much better for them rather than just patching up with um, some traditional and digital channel capabilities. So high performers are tending to do more of this modernization of their infrastructures, uh, which is a key theme for us, as well as what they also tend to do is to start rolling out this new emerging technologies, whether it is in the form of AI or analytics and so forth and embedding them. So. Throughout the webinar today, you will hear us speak about not just modernization, but also this aspect of embedding of analytics. Now, in addition, Gartner made an interesting observation where they talked about this uh, interesting attribute called composability. And they said that uh, banks with high composability will tend to have much better revenue performance. And uh, perhaps a little later, you'll start to see what this composability means means in, in terms of uh, your architecture and so forth. Uh, in much the same way, Forrester has also spoken about um, uh, how a number of banks are prioritizing application modernization. And many of them, you know, like or almost 60% of them uh, plan to modernize most of the apps that they have in place. So this is something that you're also seeing, Chuck, as you speak with your clients. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it, it, it's really interesting, especially around digital, where um, I've actually done this, where the UI for one of the banks I have some money in is completely different when you put side by side a web browser, an iPad and an iPhone. And it's really fascinating to me that the way those three different UIs are well thought out and designed. Um, and, you know, it's the exact same URL. And as you transition through them or journey through them, it just goes to show that, uh, you know, in terms of digital banking, this is really where there's a lot of thought leadership and innovation going into the, uh, you know, stream. You can probably run that experiment yourself if you just bring up a browser, bring up an iPad and look at the same URL. It'd be pretty interesting to see how different that uh, is rendered on a different device. And that's really some, some innovative work, but also the complexity of that is, uh, is happening and of course everybody is investing, all the banks are investing into technology and, and uh, you know, incremental differentiation as we would all expect. Terrific, thanks. And, and you know, a very wise person once asked, once said, you know, 
if you don't know where you're going, how do you know when you get there? Uh, interesting observation. So for me, uh, what that meant is really that, hey, you know, keep a focus on what your end state vision needs to be, uh, along with those guiding principles I talked about. So what we do here is really, and, and this is, you know, one of the first observations that I mentioned from what Jerry talked about in our prior webinar. And, and he talked about, you know, having this vision for this end state architecture. So rather than, uh, rather than speak about it in the abstract, what, what I thought I would do is to present to you what that end state architecture may actually look like. And, and so the, the diagram on the right uh, kind of shows you what that end state architecture could look like. But what I also show in addition on the left is somewhat like a, a CMM like view. Uh, so as you start evolving your end state architecture from what might be um, a, a technology stack that may be fragmented to some extent, largely because uh, it's been built up over a number of years. And as you start transitioning uh, parts of that or most of it uh, into this entire digital infrastructure, uh, what you would necessarily need to build to is not just evolving that tech stack and making it more robust, but actually making it much more highly optimized and, and very well very well integrated. So in terms of that, the architecture that I show here uh, has at its core uh, a, a digital infrastructure. And the digital infrastructure consists of number of key technologies and I list some of them all the way at the bottom in, in that orange bar that you see, uh, that is cloud enabled, that has the IBM Z. Why? Because vast majority of the banks around the world run their core systems on IBM Z. Um, it has elements of elasticity that's built in so that it, you, can, uh, you can scale up or down the infrastructure as you need or as your needs change. Uh, also enabling containerization that gives you certain really nice management capabilities. Uh, but most of all is to ensure that your operations that, that you're uh, running this infrastructure on are also, also have AI embedded in it so that you can not just automate it to some extent, but you can automate it in a highly intelligent manner. So building that right digital infrastructure is key for at the end of the day, it's on that infrastructure that your systems of records are all running, whether they are in your deposit application or your cards application or your loans application or any aspect of finance, risk compliance and so forth. All of these applications are running on this digital infrastructure. Now, sitting on top of that digital infrastructure are the business processes that you are going to construct as well as the customer experience that you will eventually deliver uh, in the form of channels and channel applications that build upon that experience to create the journeys your customer needs. So that's a typical infrastructure that many of you have built over the years. What is new here though, however, are the layers in green. So the layers in green are actually the integration layers that allow for uh, data and information to flow in a seamless manner between the systems of record and and the things in between that integration layer and the things in between are what we will call the composability stack and then above that are the process layers and the customer experience layer so for data and information to flow seamlessly whether that flow is happening in batch or in real time or in near real time it needs to be seamless and last but not the least focusing in between those two green integration layers is the composability stack. And that stack is essentially built upon what I will call as the cross product layer. And I call this the cross product layer largely because if you look at the systems of record at the bottom, they are typically oriented around specific products. So they can be deposit products. Sometimes, you know, I've seen banks where the uh, deposit products also run on different systems of record. So you can have a system of record for what used to be known as, you know, CASA type products for um, 
checking savings account type products distinct from term deposit or time deposit type products like CDs and so forth. So all of these different systems of records that you have uh, need to be need to be brought together from from not just having a product perspective but to having a cross product perspective which is what that layer uh, allows you to happen so as you move up this uh, this maturity level from having a technology base that may have been somewhat fragmented but tightly integrated moving it into a much more of a loosely integrated structure where you can have real time near real time uh, uh, integrations happening and uh, at the end of the day, evolving into a highly optimized and integrated tech stack. So uh, let me turn to you, Chuck, for your thoughts and observations as you've worked with banks going through this sort of uh, transformation. Yeah, I think you know the biggest surprise when I talk to people is the IBM point of view, which what I would call, which is which has always been around what we would call hybrid cloud. So sort of in plain English we really assert that the next generation of banking or really any industry is going to be composed of a mix of environments. And that mix of environments really spans public cloud, private cloud, on-prem. And here's the key thing that I think surprises a lot of people when they deal with IBM. Right up front, we assert those cloud environments are probably going to be from multiple cloud providers. So sort of the, you know, the A component of my perspective is that IBM's strategy around hybrid cloud has really always been sort of, uh, you know, optimized to the best place and, and IBM and non-IBM non with, you know, leveraging the strengths of the mainframe and the core banking platform going forward, including some of the newer environments that can exploit Linux on the mainframe. Now, you know, when you would be working with IBM central to a component of our hybrid cloud strategy, of course, would be Red Hat OpenShift. But a lot of these integration technologies also allow you to, you know, access back and forth uh, over many different layers or environments like that. So then, so that's sort of my first statement. The second statement is that within banking, I typically spend a lot of time on the phone with customers and, and I hear the word cloud, 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 you know, quite a bit, but I don't hear the word AI enough in, in my opinion and in my humble perspective, because just from my perspective now, I think cloud is a path and is a journey. And I think a mix of on-prem and cloud and, and traditional environments and new environments is a journey. But I, in my opinion, I think around product and pricing and next-gen banking, the wheelhouse of differentiation is going to be with AI. And so here's where we transition from traditional analytics, which tends to have a lot of human beings involved in one way, shape or form. And, and those use cases are fine and they may re actually be required or uh, you know, represent wisdom, right? Which is, which is fine. But interestingly enough, as, as we're going forward, I do think technologies like AI and maybe someday even quantum will be a, a major source of incremental differentiations for the banks going forward. And then, you know, I think uh, really, I just want to tie back to one thing. I think the, the use cases around discovery product and pricing really represent the really low hanging fruit in a bigger sort of sense. When we, when we talk about the transitions from architectures to use cases to specific use cases, things that, that we can get started with today, I really, really advocate looking at Zaffin for product and pricing and discovery in 360 view as a way to have a tangible set of projects to get started as, as quickly as possible on this journey. So back to you, Bob. Thanks, Chuck. I completely agree with you. I think the interesting thing that you brought out is the, is the layer that, um, that I wanted to touch upon at the very end, which is the, the layer in blue on the right side. And as Chuck pointed out, that analytics layer, which, which a number of banks have traditionally built to be almost like a standalone, you know, in the form of a data lake or a data warehouse, which feeds certain analytic engines and so forth. Um, that's so a thing of, uh, of the past, really. Uh, what is happening today is uh, you're not doing away with those lakes that you've built, but what you are doing is you are integrating that back into every aspect of your infrastructure. So if you see it is 
tied into your systems of record into that uh, that composable layer, composable stack I talked about, into the process layer and, and also into your uh, experience layer. Because if you do that, what you really are doing is you're embedding analytics into the heart of everything you do. And later on in this webinar, we'll talk about some two or three really interesting ways of doing it and fundamentally changing uh, how you would have viewed those aspects of product pricing, billing, and, uh, and all the key things that you do with your core systems. So, so as you look at uh, your own core modernization journey, uh, what I thought I'll do is I'll, I'll share with you a little bit around, you know, what might be some of the uh, steps that you might want to do to kickstart that journey. So I looked at it from four perspectives. Uh, the perspective of, of externalizing first. So, and this is kind of what we've all talked about uh, in uh, whether it was Jerry or some of the other analysts that have uh, been discussing this. I've all talked about externalizing this product definition, pricing and so forth. At the core, and, and this is what Chuck also alluded to just uh, a minute or so ago. Uh, at the core, this externalization of product definitions and the constructs for pricing and so forth uh, is really to enable you to get to that business agility that you really want to do. So this is all about creating the business agility and, and by the way, doing other things that we'll touch upon in a minute. But once you've externalized it, then it allows you to start to focus on what are the type? What are the types of uh, customer experience that you want to create? So, what does customer experience really mean to you? Uh, does it mean in terms of uh, in terms of the journeys you want to enable? In terms of uh, getting getting down into like the, the real details of it, like for example, uh, what segments you want to focus on? What are the cohort models you want to build for those segments? what type of eligibility, suitability criteria you want to create for this. And, and, and in addition to that, what are the type of uh, rewards and behavior that, that your customers are looking at? So these are the type of things that you want to create, which drives you into hyper-personalization and, and trying to create the type of profiles that you want. Once you've done that, now you can actually look across your entire set of enterprise applications. This includes your core systems as well as other systems that are upstream and downstream from your core to optimize not just the retail part of it, but also the entire value chain, including uh, corporate commercial sides of it. And when you do this, you're looking at, hey, which products I have uh, that I can either create a new one or refresh old ones, which are the ones that aren't performing well enough that I can decommission and so forth. And it's typically as you do this, as you look at this from an enterprise wide standpoint, that you start to think about and build some of those uh, real time, near real time uh, integration patterns that I talked about in the architecture slides previously. And as you do this and start to build and orchestrate those API layers and other layers that enable that real-time, near real-time integration, you will start to look at and build the real-time as well as near real-time use cases. I'm uh, engaged currently in uh, with at least four banks where we are looking at uh, near real-time use cases, leveraging, for example, Kafka type streaming and so forth. So I thought these four ways to kickstart, these four steps to kickstart your core modernization journey might be an interesting way to begin a dialogue. Uh, what do you think about it, Chuck? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's really interesting to me as a consumer, as a person who has money with a bank that, you know, today I'm somewhat disappointed in the state of banks in the sense that if they had a Zaffin-like offering, I would really appreciate it. I mean, my hobby is photography and I like to know about new restaurants. The bank I work with knows everything I spend my money on because I put uh, almost everything on my credit card now. I spend very little in cash. In fact, uh, I took advantage to the trip to the bank yesterday and withdrew some money. And I have not withdrawn money from a ATM machine in a really long time. 
so, uh, you know, I would appreciate uh, hyper-personalized, you know, very meaningful recommendations from my bank, which knows more about me than my doctor, um, around things that I would possibly like, and even things that would incent, uh, you know, behaviors on my part that they would benefit from. So as a, you know, user of a bank or consumer as a bank, I would say today, I'm um, kind of disappointed because only because I know what Zaffin can do. And I, I would like to see, you know, my bank use products like Zaffin to do better than they're doing today for me as a consumer, as a, you know, not, not speaking as an IBM employee, but just as a consumer. Thanks. And I, um, the reason I thought I'll share share an approach like this is uh, I know the starting point for all of our, for each of our banking customers out there uh, is going to be different. And given that there are differences in terms of how you might start, I thought showcasing this as, as a means of beginning through this externalization uh, would really add value to you. And and I say that largely, uh, you know, not just not just because um, it's a it's a architecturally it's a terrific way to get started, but actually from multiple learning experiences that we've had working with banks around the world uh, that have actually validated that if you externalize first with product and pricing, it pays off. And and the the diagram on the left really shows, hey, if you uh, didn't externalize, you can still go on, go along your journey. It may take a little bit longer uh, versus if you externalize first, then your implementation for the modernization program takes actually much, much shorter than it would have. And, and the beauty of this with the externalizing is that you can actually do it even in your planning and decision making stages for your modernization program, since it's a much broader and longer program and and when you externalize this first when i say this i mean product and pricing what you really are enabling is returns to happen from this externalization that can contribute to the broader program and help make it um, help you know, improve the roi on the broader program and the benefits can be realized even as you are planning for for that uh, larger program and and the real opportunity for you is that business transformation, even as you rationalize your product. And when I get into some of the analytic examples, you will see exactly what I mean. But at the core of all this is that you get much shorter uh, implementation times for your modernization. Now the net benefit for you for undertaking this modernization journey with externalization is that you will end up with much better risk mitigation and compliance efforts. Uh, you will see revenue improvements along the way based on the use cases you have selected, and you will see efficiency gains in terms of your operational efficiency. Uh, so uh, Chuck, I wanted your perspective. I know you have also worked with uh, a number of banks in terms of their, uh, in terms of their modernization program. Would love your thoughts on the type of benefit that we talk about here. Yeah, I think you know the the like I said at the start, I, I think there's there could be very few things fundamental to a business than product and pricing, and and then when we look at offers and hyper personalization around next generation of AI and and, and those kinds of approaches. The real reason I like this approach is that it really encapsulates product and pricing and allows you to infuse them quickly with new and innovative things. Um, so I really like the idea of a kind of an encapsulated product and pricing landscape that can be changed quickly as the innovation, you know, comes to fruition in that area. And, and again, so that would be my perspective from a customer satisfaction standpoint. From a customer dissatisfaction standpoint, if we look at banks and they're really competing for customers and customer experiences, I think the biggest area of dissatisfaction is going to be with sort of wrong, wrong uh, assertions or wrong hits around recommended product and pricing or worst case bad experiences with the bank itself or product and pricing. 
So I really do believe this is the gold mine here for externalization, really from a innovation standpoint, when you really encapsulate that and, and, and make it its own landscape or IT system, if you will, then that allows you to really infuse that with innovation as fast or as slow as, as you want, as, as a bank wants, right? Or as your banking clients demand. Right. And, and so, uh, so I always like to look at, you know, when I say you externalize first with product and pricing, it really pays off in the short and in the long term. Uh, but that payoff, I like to view it in those three buckets I show on the right side in terms of what does it do for your compliance efforts, what does it do to improve your revenue profile, and what does it do in terms of efficiency gains. And, and, and I said this multiple experiences that we've had have demonstrated that. So what I show here are really those benefits that, and from those experiences that we've seen. Um, now, very broadly at the highest level, we tend to de-risk the modernization program when you externalize, and we also accelerate the returns on your core modernization program. So when I look at the de-risking part of it, it is typically in that risk mitigation and compliance in terms of uh, reduce outages, failures, in terms of uh, dramatically shortening the implementation time for your full modernization program, and also improving the compliance practices and, and the responsiveness that you have as an organization for regulatory queries and so forth. Uh, that's what we built and that's what we demonstrated for uh, a large bank out of the Australian region. Now, in terms of accelerating the returns on your core modernization, uh, I talked about it in those two buckets, whether you're improving revenue and or improving gains in, your, in, uh, in efficiency. And again, across around the world, we have done revenue improvement where we've, uh, by externalizing the product, uh, just for the, just the first use case for one, a single product line, allowed this large US bank to generate 10 to $15 million in incremental revenue annually, just the first use case. So you can think about the opportunities for revenue improvement that exists because you can, once you get greater visibility into the type of revenue leakage that is happening, you can plug that. And once you do that, you've created the business case for uh, subsequent work to happen across other product lines. So we also enable, because of the uh, externalization, faster time to market and time to innovation, dramatically improving your revenue. And with a large uh, European bank, uh, we expect the incremental revenue from their efforts with us just along the first line of business that we uh, worked with them on around 10 million euros or so. And this was to create that unified customer experience uh, across their uh, omni channels. And last but not the least, in terms of the efficiency gains, uh, we have demonstrated reduced cost to income ratios from operational improvements. We've demonstrated much, much more reduced fixed costs in terms of the infrastructure, and we've streamlined business processes. And, and when you do this, you know, a lot of banks, when they undertake a modernization, they have product rationalization targets. Uh, we actually achieve those when we do, when we do the type of modernization with externalization. And let me, share with you the details of one bank where we, uh, and, and this bank runs its core systems on ZOS. And, and they implemented Zaffin predominantly to externalize product and pricing. So the client value that we produce for this bank is just incredible. But what I show, show here are all of the things that we've been speaking about till now. Uh, so, the bank has got its core banking system in blue that you see. And we took that existing core banking software and started uh, to externalize product pricing. When I say pricing, it's really rates and fees and, and externalize those in Zaffin on the left in gold that you will see. And it's a cloud-based infrastructure that we created for them and externalized it. And now what we do, since we've externalized product and pricing, uh, remember, the core system is still processing products, right? So it is the one that does interest calculation. It is the one that does the posting. It is the one that does fee calculation. 
and it is the one at the end of the day that is maintaining your customer accounts so it absolutely needs those those rates and fees for the products that you have now externalized but the reason you externalize is to create the agility so that you can go in and create products on the fly create uh, create differentiated rates differentiated fees based on the type of cohorts that you are going after and creating value for them and once you've done that you take all of that and bring it back into the zos uh, whether they come in through batch feeds and that you see in the lower bottom in the middle or they can be pulled and pushed via uh, that api layer that i spoke about in terms of leveraging mulesoft now the integration patterns can also include event streaming and that event streaming can happen uh, via kafka and or and or since since the core is on a zos can also be done through the data integration hub that is part of the ZOS. Now, when you do this, at this bank, uh, we created intermediary uh, tables as a staging area in their ZOS into which the Zaffin product rates, fees, et cetera, are pushed into those tables that exist as part of an extension of the core banking software. And now, when the core banking system is doing its interest calculation or fee calculation, it can pull the respected rates and fees from those DB2 tables that are that are that have been continuously updated in in real time or near real time through those integration patterns. Now, so what you see here is real benefit that we created for this bank without massive surgery in their core banking system. All we did was externalize product and pricing, and now suddenly the core system becomes massively agile in that it can ingest all of those rates and fees from the tables that we've created at the bottom. Now, to put it in perspective for you, for this bank, their product structures that used to exist in their core banking system went down from about 300 to less than 10. What does that mean? What it means is that, you know, every time a the bank needed to add a new product they would go into the core systems make a change that change would then have to be tested for all the upstream and all the downstream systems and if you looked at the bank's integration that existed between their upstream and downstream into the core there were over 60 plus different systems that are there testing every one of them is what took the six seven eight nine months to make a simple change for a single product and now that you've externalized it, you can make those changes. You don't have to test anything upstream or downstream because you're testing the product externalized. And when you feed it back into the DB2 tables, we have created in the core system the ability to map the newly created product into what it is. I'll give you an example. So if you really think about checking account, uh, how many banks really have a checking account? Really, nobody does. They all have a student checking account or um, for an employee like me an employee checking account or a gold tier checking account there are many many different types of checking accounts that exist and but so what is the difference between these accounts it's really things like rates and what fees you might want to charge for those accounts or certain attributes like do you need to produce a statement and so forth so it's these type of attributes that distinguish one checking account from another so does the core system really need to know and have all of that not really right you could externalize all of those attributes into a system like Zaffin, and then when you when you do need it for processing pull it back in and tie it back into the processing and if you did that you can now create those products much faster you don't need to go back and test each of those 60 70 different interfaces that have existed and that's the speed and time to market and efficiency gains that you get on your core side and the revenue improvement opportunities resulting from the externalization. This bank, their legacy lending structures went down from 100 and uh, from almost 125 plus down to less than 10. Their time to market, most importantly, went from 300 or so days to now a matter of a few days for new products that's the massive improvement and the very first use case that they have done 
is on track to generating about 10 to 15 million of additional revenue just uh, per year uh, of incremental revenue from just that one first use case. That's the real value that we can produce when we work together and we build that type of uh, infrastructure and architecture patterns that we spoke about. So let me turn it to you, Chuck. I know uh, you also have a very interesting perspective on this. Right, and before we go to the next chart, uh, the, the previous chart and this chart, I just want to point out and really thank that this represents a tangible documentation of sort of leading edge use cases around product and pricing. And there's tons of stuff out there that is very generic around what you should do with core banking in the future. And it, the biggest complaint I typically tend to hear is it's generic. I've been, I've heard terms like architecture and those kinds of things. However, on this webinar and as a result of the collaboration between uh, Zaffin and IBM, and more importantly, the value realized by our clients and the customers of the banks of our clients, we really have some tangible examples here that we can talk about in detail including both on the technology side of what was done and on the business value side. Very, very unique and innovative. And just the 10 second hats off to the Zaffin and IBM team that spent around 18 months to really create these four different you know, client wins and uh, document properly all this material that we're surfacing for the first time on this webinar. Um, so, so thanks and hats off to everybody. So uh, to add to that, I just want to talk about the next generation Z16 system that we announced in April and made generally available. And, and I'll, I'll do this chart after I do this discussion, a little bit out of order here. But so when Bala talks about the important point around how Zaffin enables agility, I really think that uh, that's often overlooked because in a lot of the projects, we talk about taking out cost or automating things to deal with skills, lack of skills issues, or increasing revenue. But agility in the environment we're in now has a value all of its own. And let me give another example. I was just out on vacation for 11 days. And believe it or not, on every one of those 11 days traveling on the road, at least one or two things went wrong during the day. And the biggest lesson I've learned, you know, I've done a lot of travel in my career, uh, been international, probably a hundred trips, million miles on, on one airline, almost a million on another. I'm telling you, things go wrong nowadays. You really, agility has a value all of its own, independent of revenue and cost takeout. And so I, I do want everybody in the banking industry to keep that in mind when they look at his app. Um, so in, in terms of mainframe, I think the, the biggest interesting statistic I've heard is that the N minus two product, the Z14, compared to our now N minus one Z15, we sold 40% more capacity for Z15 than we did for Z14. So uh, independent of what you may or may not be hearing around rain, mainframes, our customers are doing repeat purchases and in larger bites of capacity, especially in the banking industry. And so when we survey our customers, we just get all sorts of data points around the strategic nature going forward of the mainframe and how many and the majority of these customer facing critical system of record applications are going to be continued to be backed by IBM Z technology. And you know, before we go on to the next chart, I wanted to say always, always, always for at least the last 30 years in my IBM career, we've always talked about workload and application optimized systems and placement. Not everything's a great fit for the mainframe, but certainly from all the different data points we see, we are a strategic platform in the banking industry, certainly going forward. So next chart, please, uh, Bella. Um, so specifically, the Z16 had something interesting in it I want to talk. This 
new Tellum processor, which is optimized for AI inferencing, I think is going to represent the next generation of innovation for banks. You know, today in banking, you traditionally think of AI in, in two domains. You think of chatbots, which I've had mixed experience with chatbots. I'll sort of showcase my hand here from a personal standpoint. I don't really like them that much. I think there's a ways to go with chatbots. And I know, I know a lot of people have done a lot of work and there's a lot of positive experience with chatbots. The second thing I think, which is the real winner is this advanced fraud detection, which I think is simply amazing nowadays. And so, you know, really that is, you know, the traditional domain of, of AI and in particular, AI inferencing and AI inferencing in near real time or real time or those. So I think we're gonna see that expanding a lot going forward where AI is going to be used in real time pricing changes, real time products and offers and real time nudges and in 360 view. And again, this is the wheelhouse around AI inferencing in the intersection of the Z16 and the Zaffin product set. And the thing I do wanna emphasize here is we've laid down an operating environment and landscape where Zaffin can really be anywhere. And that's what IBM asserts with its hybrid cloud thrust and really this uh, Z16 Talon processor in the AI inferencing uh, acceleration that you get from that. It's not really training, it's inferencing. These use cases, I think we're gonna open up the aperture on that tremendously with Zaffin going forward. So thanks for uh, giving me a little a little sandbox to stand on there uh, around the new Z16, which we're super excited about. Thanks, Bala. Thank you, Chuck. And and to build on what Chuck said, um, you know, it's when we start embedding AI into everything we do, um, we not only think about driving the business from these pre-configured dashboards, but also allowing the slice and dice and ability to explore deeper into it. So I, I'll just share four things at a very high level for you, and you can see how you can dramatically change those, uh, the aspects of experience in those business areas. The first is, if you think about from a corporate banking, commercial banking use case, um, we all do what, you know, at, internally at Zaffin, we call it quote to cash, as well as what many of you uh, bankers uh, in the commercial space call this. So this is when you produce a quote uh, that is highly tailored and customized for this unique uh, corporate commercial customer. And, and yet uh, you produce the quote and then it's accepted and then you go on life as usual and end of the month or end of the billing cycle happens and you produce a bill. And the only thing that can happen is customer getting angry with you uh, because it's not the bill they wanted. Uh, if it is the bill they wanted, nobody calls to say, oh yeah, great, I'm happy, thank you. But it's when they don't that they get angry, annoyed. And why is that? Because we actually don't allow in the core systems the ability to look at how are how is this corporate customer performing against uh, the, their covenants that they have agreed to. Uh, in the agreement, and and we don't provide a, a a proactive way of looking at it, and and that's what if you can enable, if you can enable that to happen, then suddenly you will see that the reaction that uh, the interaction that you have with that commercial customer is one that is proactive in nature and not reactive in nature. Because if it is reactive, it is only you dealing with an angry customer, but if it's proactive, you can actually do something about it and um, not have uh, the customer get angry at you. So the interesting thing here is you can start to change the dynamics of how you conduct and run your business when you embed analytics and make it key to how you run and perform that business. The second is, you know, we've seen banks do cross-sell, right? Uh, and I'm showing you an example of a mortgage cross-sell. How many actually have the ability to view that funnel? So how do you see the progress of your campaign? And how many actually see that? And that's what we've enabled as part of this. If you think about offers, uh, when a bank makes an offer, it's part of a campaign that they're running and, and the ability to be able to go in and see how was that pipeline, how was the cohort that you did that analysis on, how was that transferring into actual deals that you're doing with them, that customers are uh, taking the cross-sell offer and so forth. Not just from, uh, from the standpoint of uh, a funnel, 
but also looking at it in terms of how is it resulting in terms of the uh, accounts that are getting opened and so forth. And, and also looking at what is happening to new checking accounts that may have been part of this offer and what is happening with the balances across them. So interestingly, if you can do these, uh, then suddenly the offer process becomes much more valuable to you. And last but not the least, another view from a credit card offers, which is what Chuck mentioned earlier, is something we get every week, right? Uh, take a look and see how many of you can actually look at and see who are responding from the cohorts that I have sent this offer to and on what channels are they responding? And, and maybe just as importantly, who isn't responding? And what are the reasons that they aren't uh, that they aren't responding? So the ability to do all of this, even as you construct an offer and execute an offer, and then once they have once they have accepted the offer, to try and look at what behaviors that you want to have, whether it's on the retail space or in the corporate commercial space, that's what you want to do with with your uh, embedding AI into into the application. So. That in a nutshell is what embedded AI does for you. What I'd like to quickly end with are what you can do with Zaffin and IBM. Clearly, we talked about modernizing through the externalization of product and pricing. Uh, but beyond that, you can also improve your efficiency, um, leveraging some of the automation technologies that are out there, um, increasing greater uh, optimization to happen across the operational tech stack that you have, the ability to analyze these large volumes of data at speed and, uh, and, and at scale and create the type of propositions that you need to. Uh, and as Chuck talked about, reduce or prevent uh, the type of risk exposures you may have and fraud and other type of exposures you have and losses, but more importantly, drive and uh, leverage and AI and analytics across the value chain. Uh, so, Chuck, would you like to augment to what we have here? Um, actually, Bala, you know, I think this would be a good point to ask you for, you know, as a seasoned industry expert and as a, a member of the leadership team at Zaffin, how long do these typical, you know, Zaffin related projects take? What are the skills that would be needed and sort of how fast can customers from your experience as a practitioner, somebody who has many years of experience working with customers, how long does it take till you see a return just to give the clients a sort of a perspective around the broader uh, life cycle of these types of uh, Zaffin related projects? Sure, so the, the entire modernization program uh, typically takes about 18 months to 24 months for a bank, depending on the size and scale of the bank. Uh, however, the externalization of product and pricing part of it is, is typically a three to six month journey that we talk about to enable the, uh, the first use case that you want to do as a bank. And, and, and interestingly, a lot of the uh, skill sets that are needed there from a technology standpoint, uh, the Zaffin solution is uh, almost entirely cloud-based and the technology skills that are needed are the skills that are required from uh, the ability to integrate into your architecture that you've uh, created. So if you've got streaming interfaces, APIs uh, previously set up, uh, we can work with those and, and allow for that integration to happen real-time, near real-time, as well as batch interfacing to happen. So from a skill, skill set standpoint, it is leveraging the skill sets that you've built as well as the target architecture that you are evolving to. So roughly rule of thumb, I would say, is about three to six months to start realizing business value in your bank. Okay. And then if you could go to the next chart, Bala, I just want to talk about um, laying down some next steps. So, uh, you know, between myself and Bala, uh, we are completely available for personalized one-on-one -on -one discussions with you as a client or, you know, the leadership team in your bank, or if you're a seller or a business partner and you want to learn more. Um, from an IBM standpoint, 
We're also um, you know, ready, willing, and able to run proof of concepts with our customers. We have extensive IBM garage capability. We have lots of architects on our team that can help with the integration layer and the different IBM integration products, the software products that uh, enable that connection from Zaffin to the existing ZOS-based uh, data and assets. And there's a lot of people in IBM who have product level expertise or architectural level expertise on that. And then from a TCO standpoint or from a uh, you know business metric standpoint, we do have capability within IBM to work closely with Zaf and to give you some ideas of the business value beyond the technology that we'd use to discuss that. So we wanted to make sure that you were, had an exit set of uh, contact information where you can reach out directly to either myself or Bala. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you'd like to go that route. If you have general inquiries, there's an ID called inquiries at zaffin.com that you can send an email to. A couple uh, other questions that, that generally come up. This webinar is recorded. And so both the recording and the charts will be available to you if you attended the webinar uh, or if you send an email to inquiries at zaffin.com. You can get uh, the information if you weren't able to attend the live version of this. Um, you can get um, you know, sort of the playback and, and, and the deck we used. And if you want to hear more, again, to emphasize, reach out directly to uh, Bala or myself, depending on, you know, or both of us, depending on how much you, you, and we do understand a lot of banks just like to do one-on-one -on -one type discussions. So uh, let me just check the chat for any additional questions here before we wrap up. Um, let me see if I can see anything in the chat. I do not see any questions into the chat. So having checked that, um, we can uh, say Well, let hi. me ask, uh, let, let's also ask uh, Katie or um, Kathleen, okay. if they see, uh, do you see any other questions in, in the chat, in the general chat forum? Uh, hi guys, no, no other questions. Yeah, the next one should be the 29th. Okay, so uh, before we, and let's give 60 seconds or two minutes to the attendees to post any questions or ask any questions because we uh, can stay on track for another minute and be perfectly fine to await and wouldn't be unusual for nobody to have questions, but we can certainly just wait here a little bit more to see if that were to be the case. All right, I'll just give it uh, 30 more seconds here. So uh, Chuck, any uh, last closing observations? I I, I do, I, I have a funny story I'll, I'll, I'll tell where I, I really wish my bank would have Zaffin. So uh, the property next to our house uh, just went on sale and I was actually looking at the numbers and um, you know when we talk about using Zaffin to do cross-selling and you know that that case uh, I uh, would appreciate if if I went to get a mortgage from the bank that they could also help me through the rental uh, finding you know the whole uh, ecosystem around that I think is a tremendous opportunity for banks to become more involved around just retail and corporate lending. I mean, there is a reason people are borrowing this money. The bank certainly is a first mover case of that. So again, it gets back to the importance of products uh, and, and, and offerings from Zaffin going forward, I think is really just a gold mine. Uh, yeah. and, I, and I think really to improve experience. So it's just another funny story I thought about yesterday actually when i was thinking about uh looking at this and and actually thought about zaffin <laughs> thanks Chuck. So, I, that's very interesting you said that because that is a trend that i see in the industry pulling together financial and non-financial products and absolutely and that's something that we can certainly speak about as yeah. banks reach out to us for uh, for inquiries
So I think uh, we'll leave it at that. And again, we want to um, emphasize we did provide everybody beyond the recording of the webinar and the charts themselves, the contact information to reach out to general inquiries or either Balan or myself. We're happy to connect with you going forward. So, okay, I think that does it. And if there's no other questions or objections, then we can close up the webinar. Thank you all. And Bala, thank you to your new team at Zaffin and thanks to the IBM team that made this happen as well. Um, a lot of people put a lot of work into this. Thanks everybody.